Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome. Uh, lovely to see so many of you here. Uh, I would like to know where some of you are from. So please, in the chat block, if you guys can tell me where you're from. Thanks, Karen. Hello. I uh, see that you are from Johannesburg. So um, Karen has asked me to chat to you guys today about business optimization. So I will start with my presentation shortly. And um, we've also designed a little poll for you guys to see who are business owners who are looking at um, getting involved in business and um, who are not in business. So Deirdre, if I can ask you if you can get that poll up for us and then our um, delegates can uh, do the poll for us. So I'm seeing, um, thanks, everyone's saying hello there. I see that we've got some from Pretoria, from Clarksdorp, even from Bloom, all the way over from Bloom. Well, welcome, everyone. Okay, so I am going to hop over to the slides and pop the slides on here now that everyone has seen what I look like. And then um, Deirdre will get that poll up for us. I'm not sure how the polls work. This is the first time for me on a webinar, Jam. But yeah, hopefully we can get that one going. And then I know Deirdre is also going to help us. Ah, I see that's gone live. She will also assist us with the Q&As. So why am I here and why am I talking to you guys about business optimization? So I've really been uh, dealing with businesses for several years and been specializing in trusts, tax and estates since 2001. And um, in those years, uh, clearly dealing with business owners and high net worth individuals. And I found that I really had a passion for building businesses and optimizing businesses. And often what happens is we, we run our businesses um, the way we used to. And we then don't really grow. You know, sometimes we just stagnate or sometimes things happen and it starts going backwards. And we actually don't know where to pinpoint where the actual problem is. So I've basically looked at what are the parts of business that I myself, with my knowledge, would be able to help business owners with. And that is what then brings me on to what it is that I help businesses with. So the key areas that I normally look at for businesses, and I try to develop some names that once you can visualize this, maybe this would also become easy for you to remember that these are the parts that we would need to look at in our businesses. So for me, basically, it's a not an eight step, but an eight key area approach. The first one I normally look at is the engine room, guarding the gold, the stuff that gets us into trouble. Uh, the other one, of course, let's not start a riot. The fork in the road, get more bang for your buck from good to great, and then the yardstick. And those are the things that I basically go into and measure and tweak to optimize the businesses and to get the most out of them. And um, as we go through this presentation, you will see that it, sometimes you, you have to look at all the aspects. Sometimes you'll only need to look at one of them. But more often than not, one will flow into the next. And it's very seldom that these units will be standalone units. So they often will impact one another, they will influence one another, and that is what makes it so important that we need to know where we need to start looking. And I think sometimes that's the difficult part, is sometimes we know something's off in the business, and we're not quite sure what it is. And in my years of dealing with businesses, I've often learned that what we think is the problem is seldom actually the problem. When I deal with business owners, what I'm hearing are the symptoms and not really the actual cause. So on my part, it's often having to go in and to investigate and to see what is really the true cause. And for that, sometimes you have to, um, it's like a puzzle. You, you, ha you have to go in, you have to pull things apart, you have to really assess it and then to start building. And often you'll 
start tweaking something and you'll realize, but that's not really the thing that is the major problem. Although that was a contributing factor, it may, be, may not have been the true nature of the, the real problem, the underlying problem. So let's then look at when we want to now talk about each and every one of these components and how they would impact the business and in the end, obviously impact on one another. So the first part, the engine room. So this is where we talk about the nuts and bolts of the operation. And this is often the part where very little emphasis is given. Um, I find that in businesses, often we are so busy chasing the new business. So the sales and marketing, all the shiny bells and whistles that we very seldom um, give attention to what is already in the business. So chasing the new business is, of course, very necessary. But if we don't manage what is already in the business, we are going to have a problem. So the back end operations, um, the automation, the client management systems, those are the things that I see often in businesses are either lacking or non-existent. Um, something as silly as, for instance, your filing. For instance, you may decide that, and, and this could be electronic filing, please, um, where you could decide, well, we are filing clients by surname and someone starts filing clients by first name folders. Now, how do you find people? So it's those things that you need to understand that your, your people would need a training on, but you also need to have proper systems in place that tell people what it is, how you need things to be done and to automate where you can. I often, when, when I step into businesses, I see that there's a lot of manual processes still taking place. Um, there are so many systems out there, automation systems that can take um, charge of these things. If, if one just looks at a simple bookkeeping system, for argument's sake, a cloud bookkeeping system that can do your invoicing for you, that can do the um, statements for you, that can do your stock systems for you. Um, if you are still running, for instance, on the Excel spreadsheets, th this is when things can go wrong. Um, so even those kind of things. I've dealt with businesses where we... Um, started the optimization process and the, the person that approached me had taken the business over from his parents nine years prior and the business had been in operation for 30 years and in all that time they never had management accounts they never had done they had done the stock takes but like verbal you know there was no systems in place and so and that's how simple it happens because it goes from parent to child or it's just because it's the way we've always done it so it's so important that we make sure that the back end operations um, is optimized and working properly. Now, from for each business, that'll look different. If you've got a financial planning business, that will be very, very different from a manufacturing business. And it will be very different from a um, shop, for instance, from a retail outlet. So you, you need to understand what is um, particular for you. I often say to people, when you have the right CRM system, it's so simple to actually have the system think for you. It can tell you what tasks need to be done on a daily basis. So if you've got an admin team that needs to reach out to your clients, like for instance, in a bookkeeping company, where they need to obtain information on a regular basis. You can set your systems to automate these requests, to automate tasks to your team to say, hey, have you followed up? Have you gotten that information from the relevant party? And once information is received, what do we do with it? Where does it go? What is the next step? Almost to have like a if this, then that step approach. There is a lot that one can automate in business in order to remove the mundane and it doesn't have to cost a lot of money. It doesn't have to be these very clumsy, very big programs. If you bring someone in that can understand your business and what it is you need, one can develop a system specifically for your business and that can work with your team 
and to deliver what it is that you need. So I think for me, that back end operation can really remove the mundane, it can remove the clumsy, and it can just have things ticking over. And especially with auto reminders and auto tasking, it really does take your service delivery to the next level. So I'm going to move on to the next slide. This is my personal favorite coming from a tax and financial background. I just want to make sums all day. So when it comes to guarding the gold, this is anything to do with money. Now, for the most part, I appreciate that business owners all have their own superpower. So People that start their businesses would have their superpower that would have been their strength. And very seldom is it the money stuff. The very few business owners want to sit and do budgets and tax and cash flow. Not unless that is the kind of business they run. And even then, I mean, as much as I love tax, nothing makes my heart sing more than a new tax book. Um, I sold my accounting firm because I just did not want to deal with that aspect of it anymore. I'd much rather do this for business owners than to do the mundane tax. So that being said, you need to understand that you would probably always have someone there to take charge of that for you. But you need to have an understanding of what that means. What does the figures mean? Do you have simplified figures? And often there are no proper budgets. It's just, well, is there money in the bank? Okay, then we can buy this thing. And it gets us in trouble. And if there's something that COVID has certainly brought to the fore, um, I have seen that companies that had solid cash flows, that had solid savings, that had solid budgets, were able to pull through this because they were in the habit of proper planning, proper managing. The thing is, when, when you're always on survivalist business, when you're always hand to mouth, when it's always taking money from this account to pay for that, it, it becomes problematic to plan properly. So when um, I deal with businesses, the one, the first thing I normally do is I want to ensure that there is, for instance, in the business, a form of a money market savings type of account. And in that account, normally what we would do is we would set aside um, provisions. So if I've done my month's accounting and I make sure that I get my management accounts for the month, which is so imperative, from there I can see what would have been my VAT component, what would have been my tax liability for this particular month, what would be... Um, uh, money is required if I now need to replace certain equipment. For instance, I need to uh, either employ new uh, employees or staff members, and that means I need new computers, new software, desks, chairs, whatever it is. So when a new team member joins, that is not just a warm body. It's everything that goes with that person, and that, that comes at a cost. So have I made provision for that? if I'm looking at increasing my team. Or I may have to replace some of my manufacturing equipment. Well, have I brought that into account? If I know that my equipment is coming to the end of its life cycle, have I made provision to know that I need to replace that machine? What does it look like? Am I making a cash provision? Am I making a cash provision for a deposit and financing the rest? What does that look like? And that's where these provision accounts came in. So, for example, in my previous business, what I would have in my provision account is every month, um, because I was paying that every second month, I would pay my VAT for this month that wasn't going to SARS, I would still take it out of my company trading account and put it in my money market. So now my VAT is protected. I would take out what component of income tax was as a result of this month's trading, and that would go into the provision account. And each one of these amounts moved would have its own code. So you only have one provision account, but you would have the various codes for it. Then I would have a bonus provision. Because I certainly didn't want to come to year end in November and start scratching my head on how I would now find money to pay bonuses at year end. 
Now, especially in a tough year like what we have this year, that would have gone a long way to help, even if it was just to cover your normal salaries as opposed to even thinking about paying bonuses at your end. So that was, I even had um, a provision for um, computers and software because I knew that my computers and software had a certain life cycle. Also, we used quite expensive software for our accounting and our CRM at the time. And I knew that the license fees was payable at a certain time every year. So what would I do? If I knew it was an X amount, I would take that amount, divide it into a monthly premium and take little bits every month and put that aside. And if I so happen to have a very good month, I would take more of that money and go and put that aside. So you see, when you do these things, you start making provision. But now what have you done? You've already protected the tax component. So you don't get yourself into trouble with tax because, you know, borrowing money from sales is a very expensive and very risky affair. You've looked after your cash flow because now you know what's coming in and what's going out and you've taken care of your budgets. But it all starts with having management accounts. So it's so important. And remember, management accounts doesn't have to be these pages and pages and pages of technical documents and data. All you want to know is what's been my income, what has been my expenses, what are my provisions, what is it that I need money for? And then to review that and to understand what these figures are telling you, because you need to know, am I going to be in trouble? Am I getting into trouble? What are these figures telling me? And often this is another thing that's come across is remember that the bookkeepers or the accountants that you um employ or that you the services that you enroll these people have a mandate when you bring them on board you say to them make sure my tax is up to date make sure my vats up to date make sure i don't land up in trouble but at what point do you actually give them the mandate of tax planning of growth planning in other words i would like to expand at what point do you sit down with these people and say listen my plan is to open three more branches in the next 10 years what does that look like how do i do that because here's a reality check sometimes the people that you have to do this job they are very qualified but they may not be qualified to do that to do that form of tax planning or that form of business planning that is a very specialized field very, very specialized. I mean, I have been writing exams for the better part of 19 years and I do do tax planning and I do tax planning for tax practitioners and I do it for accountants and for financial planners and for attorneys because that's my passion. But I don't deal with when I call it the mundane, with the day-to-day -day, uh, taxes and accounting. I do not draft financial statements. I do not draft tax returns for individuals. I don't even do my own tax. I do high level tax planning. So that's what I'm saying. It's horses for courses. Understand what the person's capabilities are that you bring in and then know when you need to bring in experts to advise you. And I highly recommend that you do bring in these experts on a regular basis. So you could, for instance, in either the beginning of the year say okay i now need to know what is it that i want to do for the year you bring in this person and you do a proper planning session and from there you can then have a quarterly or maybe twice a year a review to see that you're still on track or worst case scenario on an annual basis but you need to know what it is that you're trying to achieve and then what is it that we're working towards and you're going to see how this is going to tie in to the other parts of our eight key areas. I can waffle on about finances and tax for the rest of the day, but I'm going to continue. Now the stuff that gets us into trouble. Oh, dearie me. So, and this is where I decided to say that because I said so, because isn't that so true when someone throws the little finger at you and says, because I said so. These are normally where I get the, what I call the donuts there, the glazed over hollow inside look because it's all the rules and regulations and compliance and it's the yada yada fish face the stuff no one wants to listen to the boring stuff no one wants to read but the stuff that gets us into trouble now there are two routes here in companies where there's a lot of compliance required often they would have compliance offices 
Sometimes you even have, like for instance, in financial planning companies, they would have a compliance officer that would pop around and they check your compliance for certain things. So it depends on, again, the industry that you're in. My recommendation is that you would need to do a compliance review or compliance audit on your company. Again, you can bring in a specialist. Now, that could be a compliance specialist or a person such as myself that comes in and just has a review and see, hold on, when last did you make sure that your things were up to date with sub C? Where is all your company documentation? Do you have a space where you know where your share certificates are, where your um, memorandum of incorporation is, where all those documents are? Do you have, for instance, on your wall, the Basic Conditions of Employment Act? All those kind of things that you may need to have. Your health and safety, the Poppy Act that is now coming in, and that's going to affect everyone, including your staff members. It's all these things that we need to comply with. And it becomes very onerous on our business owners. And it becomes as onerous on the employees. So, you know, this is where we would need to work together. But often this, again, is not our field of expertise. And because regulations are changed so often and added to so often, you could at any given time have to adhere to seven or eight or nine different acts and regulations. So it is important that you, in your industry, need to understand which acts and regulations you need to comply with and that you are compliant with those. Um, but like I said, this is very industry specific. It's very company specific. It's just important to understand that you need to know that it certainly is there. You need to make sure that it does get you into trouble when you don't comply. So I'm not going to continue much on that. So now the next one I want to look at is our HR systems. Um, so this, the let's not start a right. This is all the people stuff. But when I say the people stuff, what I'm referring to is really the transactional. So here I'm not referring to the warm bodies per se, but I'm referring to the paperwork that ties us to those warm bodies. So here we would look at, again, the, the uh, HR systems that we're using. So are we outsourcing our payroll and our um, pay slips and all and our labor? So had we outsourced that we get proper contracts when we did uh, the initial contracts? Have we looked at updating those contracts? Are they still uh, in line? with uh, the labor law? Um, are they now uh, in line with Poppy? Because with Poppy coming in, we now need to make sure that even our employees' data is protected. And in order to do that, you need to maybe have an addendum to your current employment contracts. So these are the kind of things that one also has to look at. Also, what does your leave records look like? Do you have a proper leave record? Um, I'll give you an example. When uh, we found that we dealt with some factories um, and, and they were having some trouble with their factory workers. And it was always a question of, yeah, but my, my mother has passed. My mother is sick. My father. And then it's like, but now you've got three fathers. And so what we actually did there was we started creating um, family trees. And once people understood the employees and the employer, when does family leave apply? And when does family leave not apply? And when have you had all your leave? All of a sudden, those issues stopped because now, the, now people had a clear understanding. Sometimes we think that people are trying to take advantage, but it may not be that. It may just be that there's not a clear understanding. And once you've got, for instance, that silly little family tree, this is one mother, this is one father, these are your children, so these are the people you can have family responsibility leave for. Once people understood that, they they had a very clear um, understanding, there was no animosity, and it was like, okay, this is now clear. So it's these little things that we take for granted. 
that sometimes we just need to put out there. Policies and procedures is another thing, because if people don't have clear rules and guidelines, how do they know whether they are doing the right thing or the wrong thing? So you, you I often hear people say, yes, but they don't follow the rules or they're not doing the things right. Okay, but where is it set out for your team to know what the rules and regulations are? And here we also have things such as personal use of company resources. And why is this so pertinent right now? Well, again, seeing as COVID came across, we have had so many people having to work from home. But if your business was never set up for this, I mean, you had your people at the office and all of a sudden you had to set up your team at home, but you didn't have any policies and procedures on what does working from home look like? What are the rules here? Um, when, how, how does meetings work? Uh, how does work get completed? What is the line of reporting now? What is the use of company resources now? If we didn't have anything like that, and this would have had to come very snappy because, of course, we never had it before, and all of a sudden tomorrow everyone has to work at home, this would have been a, a real stumbling block for a lot of people, and it would have created um, opportunity for abuse, but it would have also created um, a lot of uncertainty for not only the employees, but the employers. So again, here, yeah, if nothing else, I think this has been a great learning curve for us to understand that if we are going to have hybrid teams, so some may work at the office, some may work at home, some may work half and half, um, whatever that may look like, you have to address your policies and procedures. You cannot just assume that what worked last year this time is still working now. And it is also um, of benefit to address and revisit policies and procedures on a regular basis. When I say regular, I wouldn't say more than annually, but you know, things do change. The environment changes. Traffic, for instance, changes. If we look at how ridiculous traffic became just before COVID, how it, it would take you where maybe two years ago it would have taken you, and I'm speaking for Johannesburg, I can't speak for other places, but where it would have taken you maybe 35 minutes to travel to a particular venue, that time in the last two years could have increased to anywhere between 45 minutes and an hour and 15 minutes because of maybe potholes, maybe because of traffic lights. Now you could say, okay, well, it's not my problem. My staff get to work. Uh, they need to be here at eight and they need to do their work. The problem is when your team gets to you, what is their mindset? What time are they having to leave home to get to you? What time are they finally getting home tonight? Having to deal with their families, homework, food, tomorrow morning, rinse, repeat, get back to the office. How long do you think you can do that? Working with this continued stress and then having to deliver your best. So isn't it then where one can look and see, but maybe there's a way one can build and thank goodness again, this is where COVID has come in and taught us many different ways. What about hybrids? How can we get more out of our teams? So here we are talking, remember what I said, not about the warm bodies, but about the paperwork and the policies and procedures that would affect the warm bodies. So we will talk about the warm bodies just now. So very important that again, we revisit this. I very often go into businesses and when I start looking at and, and the the um, outcome or the perceived problem is my employees are not doing their work or we are having staff issues. That's, that is the perceived problem. When I go and dig, I often find a big lack is the policies and procedures. No one actually has clear guidance on what is it, how are we expected to do things. So very important that we look at policies and procedures. I'm also just keeping an eye on time here. I don't want to run over time. Um, and then, okay, I'm not, I don't know where to see Q's and A's, but I will take questions and uh, I'll do some Q&A at the end. I want to see, before we go to the fork in the road, let's have a look at the poll. So 
Um, the results of the poll is for our audience, we've got 12% um, is new startups. Then we've got 37 um, are people that, 37%, sorry, that own their businesses and 50% that are the key decision makers. And why this was important for me is so that I know that when I'm addressing you guys, that I am speaking to, to you in terms of what it is that you can do as the business owner to ensure that we are optimizing our businesses. I really hope that you are finding value so far um, in this discussion. Okay, so now, next up, we are looking, let me, sorry, let me just get, there we go to the slides again. So now when we talk about the fork in the road, this is where we need to do strategic decision making. And this is often something where either we have people making decision upon decision upon decision, but they're not giving enough incubation time for things to really happen. Um, and that's almost like knee-jerk reaction. So you either have the knee-jerk reaction or the new idea, new idea, new idea. Or you have the don't make any decisions because of the fear of what will happen when I make the decision. And I do believe that both of these knee-jerk reactions as well as fear of decisions um, often comes from maybe not having all the information. So if we step back and look at, okay, so what could we do about that? I think part of that would be, let's look at what would impact us here. What would, what would help us make decisions better? So we have to take into account global trends, then internal trends, and then, of course, have strategic planning. Now, the global trends would be what is happening in the world around us. So that could be the world at large. And here again, we could look at, okay, for instance, we could have Corona. Then we can look at, okay, globally, uh, uh, bring it in a bit and look at what is happening in South Africa around us. And for me, the two big things here, well, three big things actually is, so we've had COVID, which caused first a hard lockdown and then um, a relaxed lockdown, but already it had impacted business tremendously in our country when we could ill afford it because we already came out of quite a, if we can call it almost a depressed market late last year, beginning this year. Then onto that now, we have had just in, in, in the last um, quarter, I would say the last six months maybe, we've, we've lost 2.2 million jobs as probably a result of COVID or majority as a result of COVID. So not only have we had loss on business, I saw Pick and Pay posted their figures this morning and also said that they'd had tremendous losses um, as a result on the bans of alcohol, cigarettes and clothing when, when they couldn't sell. So we've had impact on our businesses. We've had job losses which, by the way, results in if people don't have money. So one person loses their job, it means the family has less money, which has less disposable income, which means less money to spend in my business. Okay, so now, now it's going to move internally. But another global trend is, okay, so to add insult to injury, we now also have strike season. So in South Africa, we've had the COVID, we've had um, the job losses, and now we've got strike season. Okay. Now we go to the internal trends, and here internal trends, I'm talking about what's now going to be in my business. So in my business, as I've said, I may have the result of there's now less disposable income out in the market as a result of companies closing, as a result of job losses. There may also be a direct impact because of companies closing and I'm not able to um, get certain items, certain stock. I know of a business that I deal with that has lost thousands as a result of strikes. Not in his business. No, no, no. He needs to buy in a particular product, which he then manufactures into another product to supply to mines. So now, because he can't supply the mines, he's losing the money. Why? Because where he has to buy the component from, that company and that industry is now striking, which has a direct impact on his business that is already struggling as a result of lockdown because by the way dealing with the mines there was no trading with the mines during COVID. 
So you see this again impacts us, whatever happens around us. So there is then that internal trend. And then it's a question of, okay, so remember we were talking earlier about guarding the gold. What is happening as far as guarding the gold is concerned? That's now on the internal side. What is happening as far as my team is concerned? What is happening as far as maybe having to have a hybrid team, people are off-site. And if I've never known and done this before, I've never known how to work with an off-site team. And I have an off-site team that has never been an off-site team. Think admin and office staff. They've only all their lives known. They get in the car in the morning or in transport, they get to the office. They make their tea, they have a, a little chat with their friends at the office, and then they start their work. They've got office internet, office printer, office computer, office phones, but they also have a sense of community. And then lunchtime people talk and there's always a little buzz around. Everyone knows what's happening. And tonight everyone goes home and everyone's wishing everyone well. And tomorrow everyone gets to work and they're talking about what's happened. All of a sudden you remove all that. And now this person's left at home and they've got a kid at home that can't go to preschool or can't go to school. They're trying to do the work, but they are out of their depth. They've never had to figure out how to now work on internet at home, not having an IT guy on standby, not having a printer to quickly print that piece of paper that they can look on the paper rather than having to read their computer screen. So we often take things for granted because we are so used to doing things. But when we have to maybe put ourselves in just someone else's shoes to understand how that impacts them, these are all things that will impact our business and really how our business will operate. Because now, even though this person has all the good intentions, they really, really want to do their best. Imagine their stress. Imagine their fear and their anxiety for not knowing, A, are they doing it right? Do they have the tools to do what they need to do? Oh, by the way, and they're working from home and they have to be a mother and they have to sort out the cooking and the cleaning, perhaps. It, it's just a lot. So the internal trends need to be taken into account. And then when it comes to strategic planning, here we now need to say, okay, we've taken global into account. We've taken internal into account. But strategic planning would be, where is it that I'm hoping to go? And it could be something as simple as, you know what, we've now realized we can very successfully actually work um, hybrid. We can actually work from home um, with some time together, most of the time work from home. I don't need these big offices anymore. Okay, so what we're saying is we're going to let go of our office space. Yeah, okay, but what's the knock-on effect of that? What about when things change again? or when we want to have meetings, or what would it look like if we had the shared office spaces? Um, the, the, all I can call is, you know, you've got these like type of regis type offices. It's the only one that now springs to mind, sorry. That, that kind of thing, would that work? But if I swapped my current office space for that office space, would it cost more, would it cost less? Well, it may cost the same, but what's the impact? Would I have less things that hassle me? So, so you see, there's, there's many things to weigh up. Um, or it could be something as, you know what, I actually want to take a part of my business online. So again, one of my clients I worked with, he was in, um, let's call it interior and um, manufacturing. And funny enough, in the beginning of the year, we, we did some optimization for him and we uh, were looking at his management accounts and his budgeting, and we managed to free up some much needed funding so that we could actually go online. So develop this whole thing, took his business online and started developing this. And then one month later, COVID hit. And this was such a blessing for this person because all of a sudden he had literally, he'd taken his entire business online and he had done it just at the right time. That's what I'm talking about. When we want to make strategic decisions and strategic planning, it's what are we hoping to achieve? And believe you me, what we were hoping to achieve last year, January, versus 
now January coming may look very different. The long-term plans may still very much be there, but I think the route to getting there may have have a little bit of twists and turns in it. So I think that's something that we do need to take into account as well. So that is then our fork in the road. Um, often this is where I also get called in just to because people want to maybe upscale the business, downscale the business, exit the business, and they want to have a continuation happening. So, but again, none of this can happen if you don't take into account the other parties. Again, here guarding the gold would come in because I can have as many strategic plans as I want. If I do not have the funding available or a plan to have that funding available, the strategic planning may not come off. So important that we know what works together. Okay, next one. Oh, getting more bang for my buck. And this is really doing more with what we've got, getting more out of everything. So as I mentioned earlier, when we, we, we here we would have our resources are people, it is money, it is equipment, it may be buildings, it, it is whatever we have, and sometimes we don't see it as a resource. So when I'm talking about upskilling, upskilling would really be the training and development of your team. Um, and then repurposing, that may also be, it may be team, it may be plant and equipment, it may be buildings, um, it may be um, getting rid of certain things, trading it in for different things. Um, and then, of course, uh, leading to resource optimization. So um, here it's really about revisiting all my assets and understanding when is something an asset versus a liability because any one of my perceived assets can become liabilities if i have a if i've got plants so manufacturing equipment that i have not maintained and or um, upgraded when i was supposed to that can become a liability very quickly because what could happen is um, this machine can break down I may not have the resources to fix it, but the problem is I also don't have a backup. So now the minute this machine comes to a standstill, manufacturing comes to a standstill, nothing further happens. So it's when, when do we repurpose? When do we optimize? In other words, that plant, as I mentioned earlier, remember when we talked about budgets, is, oh, hold on a minute, this, this piece of equipment may be coming to the end of its life cycle. But end of life cycle may only mean end of life cycle for me. It may not mean end of life cycle for a smaller business. It may also be an end of life cycle because I've outgrown the use of it because of my volumes. And I may be able to on-sell that um, plant to a smaller business. So it doesn't mean that the thing has to be dead. It could just no longer serve its purpose for me. So we need to know when we need to change, when we need to upgrade, when we need to downgrade. I mean, sometimes, and I've seen this with businesses as well, they will have these super duper deluxe printing systems, printers, very expensive printers, because they may be printing training manuals. This was one of my clients. They were printing training manuals. The beauty of this is, of course, when you've got this machine, Everyone else is also printing school projects and all kinds of other projects. And then when you go and look at it and you go, hold on, if I weigh up my actual printing costs and maintenance and insurance and everything on this machine versus outsourcing this printing to a proper printing company, what would be the cost implications there? And sometimes it is cheaper to have your own super duper deluxe machine. And sometimes it is cheaper and easier to have it outsourced. So it's also when to outsource, when to have it in-house. Again, resource optim optimization. Do I need a full-time bookkeeper or do I need an outsourced bookkeeper that comes in once a week? I mean, I had my own accounting firm. I did not have one of my staff members do the accounting because of course you want to keep your, your data, your company accounting, you want to keep that confidential. So I had a bookkeeper that came into my premises once a week for four hours. 
That was her job. She came in, she did the work, she had her meetings with me, we discussed what needed to be discussed, and that was the end of that. And I would see her next week again. And sometimes she didn't even need to come into my offices, she would just work virtually. So she was not on my payroll, which meant I didn't have pay as you earn for her, I didn't have UIF, she wasn't part of my bonuses, I didn't have to deal with leave for her, she was an outsourced party. The same with my IT guy. IT guy was on standby, he was on speed dial, he came in once a week, he checked all our machines and he made sure all the backups ran, made sure all the software was legit and up to date and that was his job. But you have confidentiality agreements with these people, you have proper agreements and these people had worked with me for years and years. The IT guy as a matter of fact still works with me and he's probably worked with me for the last 12 years. So what happens is you can build relationships with these people without having them work on your payroll, that is also a resource. So understanding when something is a resource and making sure that you get the most you can out of that resource is very, very important. Okie dokie, now from good to great. Okay, so this is the warm bodies. Remember when I was saying, when we talk about the people stuff, now here we are talking about the human performance. So we back on people, but now we're talking about the warm bodies. We are now talking about the, the actual person, not the paperwork, so not the transactional. And here what is important for us to get the most bang for our buck as well is to understand that this warm body is there to contribute, to add value to my business. But the same it goes for them. We are also there as business owners to contribute to them and to add value to them. And it's not just in the form of a paycheck. It may be in the way of a sense of belonging, in a sense of achievement, in growth, in, in any part that is important to that person. So we need to understand what is their contribution in our business. And I know that um, Karen and her team works very uh, closely with the contribution compass on this, and so do I. The contribution compass for us is so important here because once you understand the actual contribution required in the business or the contribution of the individual, you can match these things. So often we... Uh, land up putting people in the wrong position and that very quickly happens when we also promote into incompetence. What does that mean? It means that I have someone that is brilliant at what they're doing and they really are good and we love them and we like this person always pulls bunnies out of hats. They just can do no wrong and then the position opens, another position opens, and we take that person, we pluck them out from where they shine, and we put them in a different position. And what happens now? We've now promoted them into incompetence because maybe that's not where they want to be. Um, I, for instance, did that myself. I had um, a brilliant senior bookkeeper working for me. He was, literally, I called him pulling bunnies out of hats. Whenever I had an issue, I'd go to him and he would just make the problem go away. He would get financials out for me in a flash. But because he was so good at what he was doing, we thought, oh, goody, we're now going to make him a team leader. And all the wheels came off. Because this guy didn't have people skills. He was not interested in leading a team. Although he could have a laugh with them and he could have a cup of coffee with him. And the people, the, the youngsters listened to him because he was their elder and they respected him. He was not a team leader. He, the, he was not interested in their personal development. All he wanted to do was sit behind the computer and pump out financials and do calculations and figure out the tax. That was what made him shine. So for even people like me, sometimes we can make these mistakes because we, we see what we want to see. And that is where these contribution compasses are so important because they actually really, they, they, they get to behind the scenes. Not what we want to see, but the truth. It'll really tell you what the person's contribution is. And it's so important for us to understand that we need all different contributions to make the whole. So just because one person wants to be around people and 
to uh, communicate and spread the news, it does not mean that there's anything wrong with that person for not wanting to do tax calculations all day long. You need the two separate warm bodies and contributions to make a whole, perhaps in your business or what, whatever those two contributions may be. Sometimes you need them complementary, sometimes you need them opposites, but it is important to understand that you need what's different from you to make your business work. Also learning and development. For some people, they do not necessarily want to learn and develop. You may find people that want to come to work, they want to do their work and be the best person that they can be in that position, and then they want to go home because their values lies elsewhere. It does not lie in learning and development. But if you have a person that has a value in learning and development and you do not develop that person, you do not give them opportunities, but they are a star performer, you run the risk of losing a star performer. So that was also quite a difficult lesson for me to learn in years gone by when I was running my own businesses because I could not for the life of me understand why would people not want to develop? Why would people not want to learn something more? But then I look back and I had a receptionist. Man, she was brilliant. She had been with me for years. And my clients got to know her. If she was not answering the phones, they would want to know from me where was she. Whether she was having lunch or tea or not there at work to the day, which was very seldom, they would actually ask me. They would send me an email and go, I found your office and she wasn't there. Is she okay? And that's what's important. But she had absolutely no desire to develop and learn anything else. Why? Because her highest value was her family. She loved coming to the office. She was brilliant at what she did. But she didn't want to learn to be anything other than my receptionist. And she did a great job at that. And then she would go home and be a great mother and a great wife. And tomorrow she would repeat it all again. And every time I tried to push her into developing and learning, she would get all anxious and she would get nervous and she hated it. Until I realized but her happy place is being the best receptionist that she can be. And I respect her so much for that. Because I think often we go through life and we, we don't learn to respect the people for the fact that what they deliver is their best delivery. I didn't have to send her on a course to learn how to answer phones because she was doing it great. I didn't have to send her on a course to learn how to send messages out and send emails because she was great at that. So I think it's the learning and development within the field that the person needs, but also understand when, how, and when not to. And then providing support is also very important. And that support can be either emotional. So sometimes you just need to be that person where the staff member can come in and say, can I close your door? I need to speak to you. Obviously, you don't want to uh, become uh, Dr. Ruth or, or the, the, the person that's always going to have to listen to problems. But you want to know that when this person, your team needs to know that if there's truly a problem and someone needs to resolve that problem, that you are going to be or that there is a person in your business that can do that. If that's not you, that there is someone that that team member can go to, to say, I am struggling with this in the business, or I am struggling with this. Remember, I'm talking about things here that's going to impact their performance. Also, we're talking about education, maybe, where they can come to you and say, listen, I have seen this particular course I would like to study, and I truly believe that this will impact my performance in this way. And then, of course, the physical Often we don't take into account that the chair that person is sitting on has been in the business for 15 years. And this poor person every day is complaining of backache, but no one puts the two together because we've given them a chair, we've given them a desk, and we've given them a computer, but the computer is 10 years old and it keeps hanging. And it's like taking them half an hour to save a document. So those are the kind of things that hampers people's performance. And not only will it hamper their performance, because sometimes they don't know any better. If you've never sat on a good chair and you're sitting on a really horrible chair every day at work, you wouldn't know the difference. But the problem is it does hamper your performance. And when, when something's hampering your team's performance, only you as the business owner or the main decision maker in the business are the people that's going to suffer. So 
And yes, I'm not saying go out and buy everyone a nice chair now. I'm saying let's look at the little things we can do to make the environment of such a nature that we want to be there. Because when people want to be there, they want to actually deliver their best. In all the years that I have worked with business owners and with teams, I have built several of my own businesses. I've had very big teams. I've had multi-branch companies. I have not once ever had one employee that woke up every morning with the pure intent of causing harm and destroying the business. Most people get up in the morning and they just want to do their best. They just want to get through the day. They want to earn their keep. They want to get back to their families. But for most people, when they when their um, first needs are taken care of, their, their feeding, their protection, their home, their family, they want to self-actualize. They want to develop. They want to deliver more. They want to be part of something. And if you can give them where they can be part of your something and you can be building something great, when you don't have to worry about your team, it, it opens your energy, I suppose, and, and your time to worry about other things in your business. Because there are two things that will impact business owners the harshest, the, the worst. It's people and money. So if we can take care of the people, we've, we've taken care of that angle. We don't have to worry about how that impacts our business. Then we worry about either the money or bringing in more business to sustain the money. Okay, moving on to the next one, the yardstick. Okay, I actually, some time ago on, in my blog, I wrote an article on where people, because I've had this often, people would say to me, oh, you know, this person used to be great and now they're the worst employee and my team don't do, do what I want them to do. So I actually did some research because I love research and I wrote an article on this. And what I found was, again, as I mentioned earlier, people don't necessarily come in with bad intentions. What often causes this people are not doing what I tell them is because we're not setting expectations properly. What are your actual KPIs? People always throw this thing of KPIs around. Do people know, and I'm not talking about the job spec or the task list that they've got. Everyone's got a list as long as they arm of tasks they need to do. But do we actually tell people not only the what it is we want them to do, but the how and the why? Because often if people understand why are we doing this specific thing and how is it supposed to be done, it'll happen automatically. It just needs to serve a purpose. For most people, if you understand that something needs to serve a purpose, it'll happen. So I think setting the expectations because also, how can you measure someone? How can you say someone is performing or someone is not performing if you don't have the expectations set first? Against what am I measuring? What is, what is my yardstick? How, how do I measure your performance as good or bad, as optimal or not so, if, if there's nothing to measure against? And it's not just in my mind, today I come to work, I'm in a good mood and now you're performing well, and tomorrow I'm in a bad mood and now you're not performing well. Because the thing is, if things are on, if it's in a list, if it's rules, if it's criteria based, it's so much easier to remove emotion from it. Because remember, we are not managing the person. We are managing their performance. And often that is also where things, where the wheels come off, is when we try and manage people as opposed to performance. So setting expectations is very, very important. Then those frequent touch points, that is, in other words, how regularly are we going to measure it? So maybe we have a quarterly check-in. And that check-in is not where you want someone to come in, sit in your office in fear, chewing their nails, wondering if they're going to be shouted at. It's really that, where are we? Are we on track? What is it that we set out to achieve this quarter, for argument's sake? Because you could also set in every quarter. What are the main things we want to achieve this quarter? Wh whatever your business looks like. For argument's sake, I can refer back to the bookkeeping and accounting business. If, for instance, I said you have got 200 clients on your client base, and I need to know that every client has been contacted um, 
uh, at least once in this quarter, that we have information for them and that we have um, every six months, for instance, done the bookkeeping for, the, for those six months. That is something you can measure. So what are the measurements? Can we measure it? Are we on track? If we are not on track, what is hampering us? Is it something that is a once-off? Is it a repeating problem? Um, is it something that we need to change again in our, remember, our engine room, in our back-end operations? Is it something that we can automate? How can we make this so that we can actually deliver on what it was that we said we wanted to deliver on? And then the recognizing performance. And this one is so key. This is not also just in those quarters or at year end when you want to hand over a bonus check. Recognition is also immediate. So when people do things right or when you are happy with performance, recognize that performance immediately. When people are doing something that is in your mind not correct or you would like them to change their behavior, address it immediately. Don't let it fester and go on and on and on until it has now become such a big thing that there's a blowout. But also understand where you're going to do this. And this brings us back to understanding the human, the warm body. Some people would like that form of recognition where you give them a certificate in front of the whole team and praise in front of the whole team. Another member would sooner die than have that. That person wants a quiet word with you, would like you to maybe come into their office and say, yeah, you know what, job well done. Thank you so much. We really value your contribution. Or maybe for another person that, like, for instance, that receptionist that I mentioned earlier, her highest value is family. The, the biggest uh, reward I could give her for good performance was to say to her, you know what, why don't you take Friday afternoon off? Thank you so much. I value your performance. Thank you for going that extra mile for me. I saw it. I appreciate it. Thank you. You can take Friday afternoon off or you can leave two hours early. I tell you, I did that. And for the next three weeks, she was mine. So it's those kind of things. Understand that one reward is not going to work for, the, for, for everyone. And the way you recognize the performance is also very, very personal. Okay, so I'm now at the end of this whole lot of waffling of mine. So now if we go back, you can now see that all of these things do tie in together. So if our engine room, for argument's sake here, is not working optimally, you can see that it's going to impact our yardstick. It's also definitely going to impact how I guard my gold. It's certainly going to get me into trouble. It may even start a riot because my paperwork's not filed properly or it's not sorted properly or I haven't brought in the right people at the right time. Um, fork in the road. I'm not going to be able to make those strategic decisions if I don't have the gold that goes with it, if I'm not optimizing my resources with banging, uh, getting bang for my buck. Uh, so, you see, all these things do tie in together, but often what we need to do with business optimization is the first step is to establish where is my most pressing need, what is it that um, I need to address first, and sometimes it's also a process of elimination. Okay, so I think I'm going to see if there is now some Q&A. Let me go to the chats. And, um, okay, so I see there's a queue here. So I'm just going to read through this quickly. Um, oh, okay. So I see does pivoting transform. Okay, so Mohammed says, does pivoting transforming considered in the get more bang for your buck how to do this with current resources and during downtimes? Is what is important now to survive in some people might argue. Um, so, Mohammed, I'm just trying to figure out transforming and pivoting. Yes. So with with ba um, bang for your buck, yeah, you would have to see what you can do with your resources. I can give you an example again. So uh, what happened is some people were looking at just selling off some of the assets. 
for instance, you are, uh, you have a couple of delivery vans and now all of a sudden you want to go and just get rid of some of these delivery vans and you want to make your team smaller. The problem is that you may trigger taxes when you do that because you may have financed those things. So you may actually now compromise debt because a big part of the finance world is also compromising debts and you may actually trigger taxes. So when you want to look at those things, Again, important to bring the right parties in to see where you can pivot, where you can change. But yes, there is, you know, I think the most important part here is sometimes we become stable blind. We are so caught up in our own businesses and in our own heads that sometimes all you need is a fresh pair of eyes. You just need to soundboard it out with someone. You just need a different perspective. To, and, and preferably from someone that isn't in your industry, someone that isn't a friend or family member that has no, um, how can I say, that has no attachment to the outcome of the discussion to just maybe give you some guidance. Another question, how to get the best of employees without causing burnout, especially during downtimes? I think, again, uh, as I said, is really to understand what makes your employee tick. Because for one person, it may be family. For another, it may be quiet time. For another, it may be community. So now you've got a person that wants to learn more. You've got a person that's got no desire to learn more. You've got one person that needs quiet time and you need a person, you've got a person that needs community. And you chuck them all into normally in an open plan office. The one that wants community is going to thrive. The one that needs quiet space will not be able to perform. So the first key is to understand what is it that will get the most out of your team. And then recognition. Because what has happened is with the with the lines between personal life and work life being blurred as a result of working from home, people are suffering burnout because they're not getting away from work. And even when they get away from work, just closing your laptop doesn't mean you switch off. And I think this thing of, you know, it's become habit that we can just WhatsApp one another at eight o'clock at night and expect an answer. It's those kind of things, setting boundaries, saying to your team, listen, guys, I really appreciate what you're doing. But let's make a rule that we do not communicate with one another after 5 p.m. Um, or before 9 uh, a.m. So that, you know, yes, we may start working at 7 or 8, but let's just give people some time to find their feet in the morning. Let them get some time to, like, just get their head in the game. Or otherwise, also something that's worked really well for teams is to have a weekly check-in. So you may have, whether you use Zoom, whether you whatever it is you use, you have your weekly check-in. And the purpose of that check-in is to really just see how are you doing? Where do you need help? Can I help you with something? I think for me, what has really come to the fore is where I feel really um, a big compassion for people, where they have small children at home. Because you try and work and you may have both mom and dad working from home now and then you've got little squeakers at home and you're trying to work and be professional. But when your child's crying, your child's crying. And and I have a lot of compassion for that. And sometimes when you are not in that position, like I don't have small children. So for me in the beginning, that was quite strange. Excuse me. Like I'm trying to have a meeting with someone and the next minute the kid's screaming, but screaming its head off and the parent will have to say, I'm, I'm so sorry, I, I need to attend to this. You have to have maybe compassion with that. Um, so, yeah, it, it has certainly been a, a whole new way of doing business. So um, I hope, Mohammed, that I've been able to help you. But I think definitely it is a, a thing of understanding your team. What what is their contribution? What helps them what works for them and then also to have clear boundaries because people are starting to burn out and um, this thing of you know like okay I'll quickly get to it on the weekend or um, you know Friday night six o'clock they're still working because they want to get things off because people are also feeling the pressure of okay businesses aren't doing well the money may not be there um, and they're doing everything in their power not to lose their jobs so that may also be something to take into account. I just want to see if I have any other questions because I don't want to miss anyone. There's another question here. Will we get a copy of the presentation? Um, I'm not sure I'm the presenter. Um, I'm sure I don't mind if um, if uh, Karen and them want to share that. I am actually sharing a 
brochure with everyone after this presentation where you will have my contact details if you'd like to reach out um, to discuss maybe some business optimization, some tax planning. Um, I also am doing quite a bit of debt compromises at the moment. So debt compromise, by the way, is an alternative to going into business rescue or liquidation. So we have found that a lot of businesses are struggling with debt at the moment. And um, I will do everything in my power to keep people out of business rescue if that's uh, possible or to actually um, keep them out of liquidation if that's another possibility. So yeah, we even do that. I saw someone raise the hand and then it disappeared. I'm not sure how to Maybe it's gone. Okay. Um, so, yeah, as far as the presentation is concerned, maybe that'll happen. And then, okay, I think, let me just see if I've got any important thing. Okay. How important uh, do you think know yourself and have EQ to ensure good outcomes? Okay. So, this is, again, very, very important. The thing with EQ is for me a big part of EQ, I think, is having that compassion and the understanding that not everyone can be the same as me. That's what makes the world go around. And so often we want to measure people, their performance and our expectations of them against what we expect of ourselves, the way we do things, the way we think, and then it, you know, we, we almost judge people for not being the same as us. So EQ is incredibly, incredibly important. And I have seen in my years in business, the most successful business owners and the most successful leaders, I should rather say, where people are concerned, are the people with well-developed EQs. Because if you can have the compassion and you can work with your team, you will get much more out of them than to try and dictate the whole time. Because when people are following you out of fear, they will do so for a shorter period of time than if they're following you out of respect. They want to work with you, not a, not, not for you, I think is, is what I'm trying to say there. I've got another question here. Um, I'm, um, I'm missing a perspective on customer experience and customer engagement. All of these are important but successful. Yes, and that is true. So customer experience and customer engagement is very, very important. So what I should have said is my, my expertise lies in the transactional, the back end um, fixing of businesses. And as part of the customer engagement is definitely also, when you have your, your back-end systems in, in place, such as your CRM, and then, of course, also understanding that your team members must be the right people to deal with those customers. Because often also what we do is we end up throwing our admin people in to deal with clients, but maybe our admin person is more to do with delivery and paperwork than actually the front end wanting to deal with people. And then the it, it's that person that may put off calling that client all the time. They'll rather email them and not phone them, but we may expect them to phone. So, yes, I do agree with you, Harold. Um, customer uh, engagement, customer experience is very important. And, again, I believe that when you've got the, the, the right back-end systems and the right team, you can certainly go a long way um, in, in optimizing that. Um, let's just see here. Is there any tips on how to find root cause of the problem instead of tackling the symptoms? Well, again, that would be a question of you would have to look at all the systems. So when I meet with my clients, I first basically see all the systems and then I would do uh, almost like a measurement on all these sections to see where there is the biggest problem. Alternatively, um, depending on the size of the businesses, we also have um, a team that I bring in and we do value engineering. And what that is, is to actually bring in the relevant team members and you do a proper one day workshop where you break down all the components to find the actual root cause. So depending on the size of the business, the size of the problem and the resources available, one uh, would bring that into the business as a workshop. And, and that is actually um, a very good solution to finding the problem because then there's no question about the problem because it really comes out at the end of that workshop when you've got the right team members in. And from there, one can work out an action plan how to then fix whatever may be the perceived problems. 
Okay, I think I have gotten role. Um, oh, what is the role of credentialed coaches and mentors is another question. Um, okay, so I think it depends on what it is you're trying to achieve. So for me, I, I personally, um, I'm a firm believer of credentials purely because I am accredited and because I've studied for so many years, I myself am an internationally accredited uh, business coach. And um, But I prefer more uh, mentoring than coaching. Um, I also have a degree in psychology. So I think it is uh, people must decide for themselves what is important, whether they want to deal with a, a credentialed uh, party or a non-credentialed party, um, and also what field are they credentialed in. Because often, um, I mean, if you want to deal with business, you need to deal with business people. Um, a life coach will get you that far, but a life coach may not have the expertise to deal with business. The same as a business coach may not have the expertise or the desire to do um, life coaching for non-business executives, if I can call it that. Um, so... I hope that answers your question. I think for me personally, um, dealing with credential parties is important. I would not deal with a, a tax practitioner that is not an accredited tax practitioner. Um, yeah, so, you know, it depends on what it is that you're trying to achieve. Uh, but also it's always what are you willing to pay for? You know, often that's another question. So what exactly is it that you're willing to pay for? Okay, guys, um, I have actually gone over my time slot. It is now quarter past 12. Um, I have addressed all the questions here. It's been so great. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I really enjoyed the presentation, and I hope that you have uh, gotten some value from this. And please feel free. You're welcome to reach out to me. You will all receive um, the brochure with all my contact details. So thank you very much. Have a good one.